action. Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Johnson, and with me, as always, is scientist Frank Marchis, and this is The Grudge Report, SETI Institute science show following Star Trek Discovery's latest episode. Spoilers abound, so if you still haven't watched the most recent episode, turn back while you still can. Hi, Frank. How's it going? Hi, how are you, Beth? I'm good. And you? I'm good. Holding up. <laughs> yeah, same here. So, the show... What did you think about this episode? I thought it was really good, um, but I keep saying that every week, so I'm not sure that I'm to be trusted anymore. <laughs> and for me, it was a typical like someone. I read someone make this comment too. The typical Star Trek episode: there is a planet, the ship visit the planet, we have a problem on the planet, the ship saves the planet, the ship <laughs> done. That, that uh, yeah, I think that can summarize a whole lot of Star Trek episodes. But I mean, when you're on a five-year, when it starts off with a five-year journey to explore your, your galaxy, then then yes, that's, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah, you have to visit a lot of planets, and there is always something interesting, fun, or weird on each of those planets. So let's talk about the planet that was visited, maybe. Or you want to tell us a story be before? So really briefly, the rundown here is that uh, Book is from a planet called Quajon. He's somehow received through his courier network uh, a message from his uh, blood brother, essentially, uh, that he needs to come to the home planet. They have, of course, you know, again, planet has an issue. The issue here is that the people are starving. The destruction uh, caused by the burn did some damage in subspace that shifted the moon's orbit that made change the tides and has sent these pilfering sea locusts in from uh, inland, destroying their crops. So, of course, they have made a deal with the Emerald Chain, which is the Orion Andorian Syndicate, and those guys are protecting them, providing them with a repellent that sends the locusts back out. But of course, something's gone wrong. Something hasn't gone wrong. What it really is, is they want the Andorian that they rescued from the prison planet. Um, and uh, so they're basically, it's it's just basically the Emerald Chain trying to get back someone. And, and there's a whole subplot in that. But yeah. the main point is just, going to Quajon and solving this big problem. So Quajon is the planet of Book. Yes. And uh, he's, not, he's not his blood brother that you mentioned. He's kind of his emotional brother, his right. empath brother, or something like this. I have this kind of weird way of communicating between this, in this in, with these intelligent species. They, call, they will call themselves the Quajinian. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe? Yeah. Maybe, so what, I think. Yeah. So the planet itself... Um, yeah, then kind of, I mean, it really looks like Toronto. <laughs> um, I, when I saw the forest and the trees and the leaf, I said, yeah, they are in Toronto, they're in Canada, and they're nowhere any, anywhere else. Um, vegetation is the same, same gravity, atmosphere again, perfect for human being, class and planet, typical mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, Star Trek for this kind of... Uh, Bipolar, uh, bipolar civil uh, human, humanoids. Um, yeah, so the planet has this weird species called the locust. They are kind of insects. They fly, but they're not really flying. I think they have this balloon. They're, they're, they seem like uh, air jellyfish. Yes, exactly. But they can live apparently in the, in the water and in the air. Right. So when we see the planet, when we arrive in the planet, the first thing that really kind of surprised me is the color of the planet. It's right, blue. everything they, they showed us. I mean, the trees are all, it's, it's just very red. It was very red. Everything was red. And for all that they're telling us that there's, you know, there's an ocean somewhere out there, we never actually see any evidence of it unless it's red. Yeah. We see, <laughs> the only time we see an evidence of the ocean is that when, when they show the, the map, of Book and, um, and Michael together, uh, we see a continent, which is basically kind of circular, surrounding by red water. But yeah. I'm sorry to tell you, water is not red when it sees from, from far away, especially when it's, we are close to, a, when you have a planet which is illuminated by G-type stars, because that's what was, 
considering the color of the atmosphere and the color of the of the people the the, the star which illuminate Quajan is probably a G-type star, like the sun. Right. So if there is water, water in an ocean, the water should be blue. That's, uh, that's what we expect to see in this case because of diffraction. So I why- mean, I, I wonder if it was sort of supposed to be the type of sensor that they were using. But as you, you know, even on maps that we have here, when we show the vegetation is red to make it stand out, it still doesn't make the, the water turn red. So yeah. I'm... Not sure what was going on with this one. And we see for uh, for like half a second, we see a landscape from above, and we see water, and the water is brownish, mm-hmm. and the and the environment look kind of um, the fjord of uh, Norway or something. Norway, or um, it's more like a lake or a pond, a big pond than a, than an ocean. So yeah. Yeah, it's a mystery. And then they mention as well there is a, uh, there is um, a moon, and nowhere in any of the moments we see the planet from above, we see the moon. Not once. Not once. No moon. No if, moon. If, so. if that, it's like, okay, well, was the moon's orbit shifted so far away that you no longer have tides? Because where's your moon? <laughs> did, did I know you leave it in some space. And... Tides, but I cannot tell you anything until I see the moon, at least to get an idea of the size of the moon, of yeah. the location of the moon. I mean, well, I thought it was interesting that they make this big point out of, you know, oh, the burn damaged subspace and it shifted the moon's orbit, which I, okay. Yeah. And, you know, that's caused, okay, I get the moon shift, the moon's orbit shifting definitely causes tidal issues. I get that completely. I don't understand, and I'm, and this goes back to this, this whole start the subspace thing, like the damage to subspace has affected the moon. So I'm, but I think that's a trek thing, and I'm gonna just kind of let it go now. Yeah. So the moon tides are important on in planets, and we know that for our own planets. If we just talk about Earth, tides are kind of we think that life appear on Earth. Uh, there is a one of the way we think this appears from pounds. And tides basically uh, filling up and and cleaning slow, the water in ponds, and so forcing bacteria before bacteria molecules, complex molecules, to be very close to each other, concentrate, mm-hmm. and that's the that's the way life may have appeared on Earth, and that's one of the reasons we say we need to have a moon to have tides to have life. Right. But and that's it, one of the reasons I know a lot of scientists are interested in finding exomoons. Exomoons are one of the things that we are the new, yeah, it's a new frontier. Okay. We point. found planets, now let's find now moons let's around find moons. planets. <laughs> because we know that we, uh, we, we suppose that we cannot have life, we don't have tides, we don't have moons. So let's find the moons. Right. So there is one moon which has been suspected in the Kepler data, and I forgot which Kepler number it is, I should have checked this out, but it's only one, and it's the size of um, of Neptune, I think. So it's a huge moon. It's not a, we're not talking about the tiny moon like like our own moon. Um, we may be able to detect one of these small moons uh, soon. Uh, in fact, Tess may be able to do that. Plato will probably do that as well in the future. Yeah. Those are missions that are currently searching for exoplanets by transit. And Plateau is going to be even better, and we'll be able to be more sensitive and see planets like Earth and maybe the Moon as well. And and uh, JWST will that help too? I'm not sure JWST will help detecting moons because uh, uh, JWST will contribute significantly in getting. Oh yeah, maybe by by measuring the transit, the secondary transit. That may be, may be possible to detect the moon. But we need to find a good target for, for JWST first. We need to get JWST up first. Yeah, and f- yeah first. First get <laughs> up JWST and then find a good target. But anyway, so, so there is a progress, there is some progress in science at the moment in finding moons. And I uh and there is there will be probably a, a moon uh, announced in the next five years around uh, one of these Earth-like exoplanets or super Earth exoplanets. Okay, you heard that here first, guys. Frank says, five years for an exomoon. <laughs> Around an Earth, Earth-type kind of thing. Exactly. <laughs> and it's going to be recorded so you can use it later. 
exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're going to use that for your grant funding later. Okay, so then we can talk about the very big... So that, yeah, that's, so that's plot line one, is uh, dealing with uh, Quajon and their intrigues and, and politics and drama and uh, biology, apparently. We'll get back to that. Uh, the secondary storyline, of course, is we're still trying to find the source of the burn. And so, of course, this being Discovery, Stamets calls, you know, people, it calls Saruin and says, we found it. This is the Verubin Nebula, which I'm just still tickled by. So uh, this nebula is clearly named for Vera Rubin, who was uh, an astronomer who basically found the first evidence of dark matter like she provided the first evidence of dark matter based on how we predicted galaxies should spin and how we actually observe them spinning exactly. so there's there was a difference and the difference is dark matter uh, so they, we did we we have an estimate of the of the mass inside the galaxy we know how stars should be orbiting around and they don't orbit at this speed mm -hmm. in fact continuously orbiting at the same speed, even when they're far away. So what they, what cosmologists decided to do is to add dark matter. Somewhere we, something we don't see, but seems to be kind of... It exists. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't reflect light in a way that we can find it. We don't it. see it. That's the we reason. We don't see it, yeah. yeah. Uh, so they've, they found the source in this nebula, and they've picked up a signal from the center of it, which... I think is kind of interesting when we, when we relate it back to uh, our own SETI work, right? Like that's what we're trying to do. One of the things that, that we're looking for is a signal out there that we can say is not natural. And so that's what they found. They found a signal. It's not natural. They've determined uh, how fast it's going and they can actually hear this song that's kind of been threaded through uh, some of these episodes. So um, The melody, they call it later on. Uh. Yeah. Right. My, Michael had referenced it before that it's, you know, a lullaby that was sung on one episode and it's a cello part that's played on another episode and it's been around for generations. And it turns out that it's actually hiding a signal in this nebula. And the, the signal is an emergency signal from a Federation ship. So there's a ship in the middle of it with a distress call. And we still don't know what the distress call says but again, that's what they're working on. And so they've had to filter out certain sounds to get to the signal because there's all kinds of things going on. There's, you know, there's another star that's doing something and, and adding to the noise. And so they've, yeah. they've done all of this. But I like the, the scene is very interesting because it kind of illustrates the way you, from noise, from a signal that seems to be noise, you can basically find an artificial signal. And it's exactly what we will we have to do with SETI, in fact. And we've a lot in, in scientific in research that's what we spend a lot of our time doing, identifying a, a, a repetitive pattern into a noisy uh, signal. Of right. Sig signal to noise ratio is a term you will hear us use a lot in science because basically it means we have all of this data and somewhere in there is what we actually need and the rest of it is the garbage we're trying to get rid of and filtering out all of the noise is is a challenge and it was a challenge for these guys they actually needed uh saru's uh different biology and the different uh spots on the em spectrum that he can hear and see uh not hear but see and <laughs> <laughs> She is in a mood. Uh, this is my grudge, everybody. This is Puck. Um, she is not as big as grudge, but she is weighty. And she's yes. also always, she also always wants to be on TV. Yes, she, <laughs> she is a TV cat. Um, but yeah, but yeah so. This, this is interesting that you mentioned that they use a different signal, uh, the capability of Saru, who is not, with an, in a different species, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, how you call this species? A Kiplan? Kel Kelpian. 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 Um, so there's multiple things to talk about here, but one thing that always surprised me is that they have super amazing computer. They can do 3D shape modeling, everything, etc. They hear a sound which is kind of at the same frequency that human sound. They mentioned that. That what human can hear. So I checked, human can hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. This is young human, 
And when we get older, it's between 1,000 and 4,000. You basically stop listen, uh, hearing the high frequency when you get older. Have you have you ever tried any of those videos that they have on YouTube where like there's a high, it starts at like the highest pitches and then, or it starts at the lowest pitches and then works its way up. And if you're sitting with your one of your teenagers, we both have teenagers. If you're sitting with one of your teenagers, they will continue to hear those high pitches long after you're like, I hear nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so it's it's interesting how not only do uh, we have different species, but as humans, we our our range of hearing changes. Yeah. So this uh, uh, Saru seems to be hearing lower frequency than us. That's why I think he said boost the high, lower frequency, and he can he, he can hear a signal which has a lower frequency. Um, Animals will he, will be different. Uh, hear different frequency, of course, and generally the frequency at which you hear is relative to your size, because of the size of the membrane of right. your ear. So the size of the ear canal and all yeah, of that. Yeah, exactly. So smaller animals like bat can hear higher frequency. They can hear up to one hundred thirty thousand one three zero 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 zero. Um, Saru is the same size as us. And he can hear very low frequency. So it may have something very weird in his ear. I don't know why. Well, he is he is a bit taller. So there is a chance that maybe that it, that ear canal is a bit longer. I don't, but, and his head is very different. So, you know, he has, he has definitely different things going on uh, physiologically than we do. And this, yeah, this is Star Trek. He's not real science. Yeah. So that helps. But that's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting that they can hear, he, he basically found this signal by, its, by himself. And, uh, and once again, I say that it, they have a lot of, they have access to high technology uh, instrument, but it does happen a lot in science that you have access to supercomputer, uh, visualize, you visualize very complex data and so on. And you don't see anything, and then someone come in the room and see the thing and say, "Oh, look at that! This is weird." And that's the explanation you have been looking for for months. It does I, happen. I, I did that once, actually. I I did that to my science team. I said, "Hey, this looks like it's res it's a resonant uh, frequency," and my professor turned and stared at me, and he said, "All right, hold on." And we changed the numbers on it, and then we found the signal. See, you have you you have your several moment. <laughs> yes, I have. I have had my Saru moment. It's probably one of the, the highlights of my undergrad right there. <laughs> but yeah, it does happen. And I think it's kind of cool. It does show that uh, you need to, it's not only computer. Science is not only about equation and computer. It's also about visualization, seeing patterns that other people will not see. And uh, Right. Different perspectives make different science perspective better. Very important, yeah. So, um, and beside that, uh, Oh, I just wanted to say that the way they define nebula into the Star Trek kind of irritated me a little bit, but that's because I'm a scientist. A nebula in our galaxy, it's an area with high concentration of dust and gas, and they are shiny because either because there is young stars that illuminate this gas and dust, mm -hmm. or because they have, uh, they have, uh, they're surrounded by dying stars, which are extremely hot, like white dwarf. So there is planetary nebula, which are this one, or there is nebula like formation of young of stars, like the Orion Nebula. Right now, by the way, if you are watching us now in December, if you look up in the northern hemisphere at 6 p.m. toward the south, you will see Orion. You take a binocular and you will find the Orion Nebula. It's easy to it's, see. Yeah, it's in the belt. So you just have to look at the belt and you'll see it. And uh, there's always... This time of year, there's always tons of really good astrophotography out there too. So you can check Twitter and uh, I try and find them as well. So hopefully, maybe this Sunday, I'll, I'll try and see if I can focus our, our uh, astrophotography stuff on, on Orion that we share out. Yeah, I did a tour of the Unistellar Eviscop last two weeks ago of Orion. And I, sh I show some of the nebula. There's a flame nebula, the Orion nebula, the uh, Running Man nebula. Those are very cool. And then, of course, there is a um, horse head. Nebula. Right. Yeah. Oh, I know that friends of mine have been processing the horse head lately. So that's I'm looking forward to some more of that. This up. nebula, to go back to the very one, very beam, very, it's yellow, which I've never seen a yellow nebula. So maybe... I like wasn't that. sure if that was yellow or if that was just what the computer was shaping it with. Like, that's... 
because I don't think that was an actual depiction of the nebula oh. itself. I think that was a depiction of the material. The material inside. Yeah. So I don't think it was actually yellow. So I think I think we're safe there. But but explain why you're really bothered by their description of the nebula. Like what because they said the about it. Because the most common material in space is hydrogen. So when you look at nebula, you see them red because what is excited is basically the atom of hydrogen. Most of them are reddish because of that. So Orion Nebula is red, orange, pinkish, but I've never seen a nebula which is yellow. Of course, they may have them, there is maybe some yellow nebula, but I don't think I've seen any yet. Uh, um, and I was surprised to not see the, comp the red component at least surrounding this, this nebula to make it more real. But eh, I'm a scientist. As I say, it's not fun to look at, to watch a movie, a science fiction mo movie with me, except if you tell me, do not say a word for the entire movie. That's the, that will save you a lot of your, t of, of your time. I'm, I'm, I'm not any better. I'll, I'll admit to it. And, and it's great because my husband has a degree in biology. So between the two of us, we just get really cranky. He was cranky watching this episode with me because he just really sees no reason for uh, any sort of, of uh, bipedal species like us to develop that sort of empathy and for it to work on uh animal creatures of of any type and he was he was we kept we were having a very long discussion as to why i think it's fair and he doesn't so so he was yeah. basically saying that we should invite him to the show next time <laughs> <laughs> he was basically saying that uh, empathy is not part of the evolution evolution of a, of a species it's right a, and, and he says he says you know evolution doesn't happen very quickly and and he doesn't really think that there's a reason for that to be a thing and uh for um, for it to to have developed in the first place, um, and then I pointed out, well, it it's kind of a throwback. It actually developed. It actually has evolved out of his species, and every so often, one of them is like a throwback and and has this because he talks about book talks about this in the first episode, and and I'm not a biologist, so I'm, I'm taking my husband's words here, but in the in the first episode book talks about how he is actually a genetic throwback, that he has this empathy when most of his people are hunters, but he can't do it because of course he has empathy with animals. And so he, he's, you know, kind of the outcast for it. Yeah. And we see some more of that, but then his half brother or not half brother, but his, his brother from another mother uh, seems to have the same throwback Right, because they're the big solution to moving the sea locusts back, and of course, discovery has to help, and they boost the signal, and you know, use their their empathy. Which he, as he says, it's not it's not like a, a push; it's more of a request. You know, mm -hmm. he doesn't make animals do something; he asks them to do it, and so that's why he can handle transworms, and that's why you know and that's how they're moving these sea locusts. So, point of fact here was to me at least, and point of fact is sort of. It's Star Trek. <laughs> it could change next week. Um, but because of that, it, it said to me more that the, the empathy evolved out. But my husband doesn't see a reason for it to have evolved in, in the first place. So he's, he was, as a biologist, a little bit bothered by that one. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, don't know, know either, but <laughs> I mean, it's, it makes the show more interesting, of course, to have this kind of uh, non- weird evolution in species. If they were all evolving like us, that would be kind of a boring show. Think about it. Every time they go on the planet, what do they see? Another version of Bess and Frank sitting <laughs> on the sofa and chatting on, the, on Zoom. That would not be a very interesting show. <laughs> no. We can barely get people to watch this for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was a good episode. Again, it's like you said, it was a very typical Star Trek episode. We show up at a planet, we help save the planet. You know, it's, that's how it works. And we make a few enemies along the way because now, of course, the Emerald Chain uh, is, is not going to be appreciative of how things went. There was there is a really cool uh, flight scene. Uh, Detmer takes book ship to shoot at this Orion vesicle, vessel vessel. It was, so Star, it was so Star Wars. It was. It was, like, it was, was very was, Star Wars. Was there was. Movie. There was a lot of pew 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 <laughs> pew. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, but it was cool because you got the you got the Andorian refugee uh, refugee. We'll call him a refugee whose antenna have been cut off. I have questions about that because I my, I thought my understanding was that Andorians could grow them back. So I, but I don't know. Again, Star Trek things change. Um, but of course, Gred shows up and it scares the hell out of the Andorian, which I thought was hysterical. Because if that one suddenly, or is she over here? If this one suddenly jumped up on someone who didn't know she was there, yeah, I bet that would startle them too. But um, that was it was a fun scene. I just, you know, it, it it was kind of a show that had everything. There was like a whole emotional thing going on with Stamets and Adira. Uh, there's Giorgio's, like, uh, there's, like, I think there's like five plots in this show. There's, there's Giorgio's, whatever is going on over there. Uh, she's reliving some deep trauma in her head that's literally breaking her apart. I am not sure where that one's going. Uh, Stamets is trying to make Adira a part of the team and understand them and so you know that's that was cool and he and Hugh and all of their interactions are just so adorable I love them and then we have Detmer trying to handle get a handle on her post-traumatic stress stuff where she's you know terrified of piloting because she crashed a ship once and now she's you know questioning her abilities and, and so that was kind of cool to see a breakthrough there there was a lot going on in this episode there was there was a yeah. moment where I realized I had stopped taking notes for about 15 minutes because <laughs> I was just so engrossed in everything that was going on you forgot to mention that uh, Saru found his uh, catchphrase so he's gonna Diddy. be carry on Diddy. Diddy. <laughs> are we really okay so yeah, the the little the little running gag this time. Well, there were there was kind of two because one they're picking on Linus again. Poor Linus. I'm starting to feel really bad for how picked on Linus is. Apparently, Linus is shed going through a shed because of course he's a a lizard biped bipedal creature, and so he's shedding, and so they've confined him to quarters. And and it comes up as a joke a couple times. And then, of course, now the other running joke is that Tilly's first big mission as, as, as number one to Saru is to help him find a catchphrase. And it's just, it's kind of sad to watch, really. Yeah. <laughs> he does find something. I mean, the catchphrase is something that basically is part of Star Trek. I look around and I saw that... Uh, uh, Picard say what? What does he say? Engage. Engage or make it so. He had two, yeah. really. All right. Well, we will see if he's gonna keep this one. The good news also is that at the end of this episode, is that books basically has decided to join the Federation to to basically continue working with the Federation. He's been convinced of the interest of the Federation. He's been convinced at least that Discovery has the right. Uh, motivations at heart. So, so that's me. We're gonna, he's gonna stay in the episode. It's gonna be interesting. Maybe we're gonna see more of his empath power to use to communicate with other species. It should be really interesting to see. Um, I this season is so good, but I keep saying again, I keep saying that every week. So probably don't trust me on it anymore. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Beth. Well, Do you have anything you, else? Brock. Uh, I don't think so. I think that kind of covered where I was at with all of it. How about you? Anything, any final thoughts? That's all for me. It all right. We see each other, uh, Friday or Saturday this week. Okay. Yes. So that's it. We'll be back next week. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Feel free to leave a comment down there or five with your thoughts, questions, compliments. Um, compliments would be nice. And. Now, thank you for watching, everyone. Have a good rest of the week.